Greetings. Welcome to the Taiwan Post New Wave Cinema Series. I'm Biu Zhang, Deputy Director of SOAS Center of Taiwan Studies. Today's roundtable is one of the highlights of this series. We at the center are very excited about this rare occasion to have six leading film scholars to examine and explore Taiwan's cinematic development of the last 30 years. When we planned the series early this year, we only had a vague idea what we would do. However, the goal has always been very clear. We want to find out what happened after the cinematic turning point of Taiwan's uh, new wave of cinema. There has been abundant uh, academic research on Taiwan's new wave and also the important authors associated with it. And yet, little academic attention has been given to what has followed. Our focus is to map this less noticed uh, cinematic landscape, examining the aesthetics of new Taiwanese films and introduce new directors whose names might not be widely known to audiences outside of Taiwan. The roundtable discussion today is a starting point from which to trace the trajectory of the new era and bring attention to the younger generation directors. We are honored to have six leading film scholars on the panel who bring their critical insights and expertise to this intellectual investigation. May I introduce these six panelists in alphabetical order? So first, Professor Chris Berry, just show up here. He is Professor of Film Studies at King's College London. Second is Dr. Chen Bingquan, a former director of the Taiwan Film Institute and currently the Director of Cultural Division Taipei Representative's Office in the UK. Then next is Professor Robert Chen, Chen Ruxiu. He is Professor at the Department of Radio and Television, National Zhengzhi University, Taiwan. Dr. Wafa uh, Giamani, uh, I'm not sure she is here just yet. She is Curator at the Cinema sorry, Cinematheque uh, Francaise, and Professor Song Hui Lim. He is Professor of Cultural Studies at the Chinese University of Hong Kong. Then last but not the least, Dr. <laughs> Dr. Corrado Neri. Uh, he is Associate Professor at the Jean Moulin University, Lyon 3. Thank you all for joining us today. It's a, a great pleasure to have you here. I would also like to just quickly go through the eight areas of inquiry that uh, we propose to consider in this session. The first, the starting point is the basic question, right? What is Taiwan post new wave cinema? How do we define it? Is there a particular style, a, preve a prevalent a genre, a shared concern or a prominent subject matter? Or is it defined by important authors, a period specific era, the revolutionary development in technology, for example, the uh, availability of high definition digital cameras or a particular aesthetic style? Then we move on to the issue of who. Who are Taiwanese uh, uh, post new wave directors. Can they be defined as a group just like the new wave? Then we are also interested in uh, identifying the continuities and ruptures between the new wave cinema and the post new wave. This then leads us to consider the issue of uh, terminology. I know it might be a little bit uh, problematic should it be labeled as Taiwan's post-new cinema or post-new wave cinema? 
or something else to specify the differences between the transition and the transformation. So, you know, we are not saying it is definitely called post new wave cinema. It is just a kind of inquiry. How about documentary? Should documentary be uh, included? And in terms of aesthetics, are there any commonalities between the younger directors, for example, in their cin uh, cinematography, their styles, genre, uh, subject matters, acting, as uh, artistic uh, influences, and so on. Lastly, uh, do the post new wave cinema deal with particular uh, sort of uh, subject matter that were not dealt with uh, previously, or they did actually deal with similar things, but in a very different manners. We will start the discussion with an exploration of the term post new wave by Song Hui and Wafa if she arrived, uh, then move on to consider the characteristic of these films from directors, genres to subject matter. That, that's being tackled by Bing Quan. Corrado, then Robert, and conclude the discussion with Global Perspective by Chris. Before we formally start the talk, I know, as usual, I would like to thank our funder, the Ministry of Culture, Taiwan, and the Cultural Division at the uh, TRO in the UK, and our gratitude to the great support of the Taiwan Film Institute. Without their generous funding and continuous backing, it would not have been possible for us to launch such ambitious project. Please be aware this session is recorded. I would appreciate that if you can turn off your vi video and audio uh, functions. We will start to take questions 30 minutes into the session. Our assistant uh, curator Xiao Yi will inform you when the chat function is open, so please be aware you can always post your question there. Could you please post only one question at a time, no more than two in total, and keep them succinct and please relevant to the theme. And show you will collate the questions and present them to the panelists. After all this, without further ado, Song Hui, the floor is yours. So let me uh, just use 30 seconds to just uh, make everything work. So I need to find some way first. Ah, okay, so I, I'm going to spotlight you, but not yet. Okay. I'm going to upload your um, PowerPoint. Okay. Please, don't worry, it's up to you. Okay, uh, thank you, Piyu. All right, uh, I'm going to speak very quickly, and I'm also, built because I've got a lot to cover, and uh, I'm also going to use quite a bit of Chinese materials, so apologies to those of you who don't read Chinese. Okay, so the question I'm going to address today at this round table is, uh, what is Taiwan's post-new wave or new cinema? Uh, and I suggest that this is a question about film historiography, that is to say, who gets to decide what to write about film history? So I will start by tracing the, the discourse of the post new wave uh, and give a bit uh, and say a bit about the context of its emergence. I will then um, distinguish between two takes. Uh, one is a more conceptual, theoretical or ideological take of the term, and the other is a more empirical take. And I'll end uh, with my own take on the term, which is uh, to argue that post new wave period uh, actually signals an effective turn in Taiwan cinema. Okay, so uh, to go back to historical period, actually Taiwan new cinema was already declared dead as early as in the publication in 1991 called Xin the death of new cinema. And three years later, the same um, editors uh, produce another book called Xin Dian Yin Zhi Wai or Hou, so Beyond or After New Cinema, 
right? So, so the idea that cinema, new cinema, the Taiwan new wave cinema is dead, uh, was already there uh, in the early 1990s. But the specific term uh, post new cinema, ho xin dian ying, uh, really only emerged in 2000 after 2008, uh, and specifically in relation to the film uh, by uh, Wei De Sheng called Cape Number no. Seven, Hai Jiao Qi Hao. Uh, and I actually wrote uh, quite a bit about this in an article uh, published in 2013. I can share this bibliographical source later if anyone is interested in looking at that. So uh, this discourse uh, first appeared very formally uh, at an academic conference uh, organized by Academia Sinica in 2010, but it has also uh, caught the attention of critics more generally. Uh, and I want to begin by saying that the prefix post Right, because you're talking about post new wave or post new cinema, the prefix post represents what Kwame Anthony Appiah calls a space clearing gesture. Right, because when you say post, you mean what you mean is that the thing that comes after the hyphen is over. We are moving on and we are moving beyond. Right, so in this discourses of post new wave, what I can distinguish is that there is a gesture of or they, they, they tend to argue that the post-new wave period has moved on from the transnational soft power of author-led art cinema to the domestic people power of audience-endorsed popular cinema. Right. So this is the main uh, thrust of the argument that I can distinguish from the post-new wave uh, discourse. And the evidence of this uh, comes, I'm actually going to, to, to skip this one. Uh, that's like the evidence of this comes from um, the box office miracle of Cape number seven, right? So for those of you who don't know, uh, the film took in um, 530 million New Taiwan dollar in Taiwan uh, that year. So it was the top grossing film in 2008, uh, beating all the Hollywood blockbusters. And it also was the second highest grossing film in Taiwan's box office history at that point in 2008. And it was also the all time box office record for domestic film and was double that of his closest rival, which was Ang Lee's last caution. So, and to put this in more context, uh, Cape Number no. Seven, with his box office success, pushed the market share of domestic films in Taipei over the 10% mark for the first time in decades. Right, if you look at the figures for the 12 years preceding it, and that's where the box office intake records are available publicly, they typically hover around the 1% to 2% mark, sometimes even as low and pathetic as 0.2, 0.3, and 0.4%. Right? And the exceptions were in 2000, in the year 2000, when Crouching Tiger, Hidden Dragon helped to push it to 4.65%. And in 2007, when Ang Lee's last caution helped to push it to 7.38%. But Cape Number no. 7 was the first film that helped to push the domestic film's market share to over 10%, right? So this is the evidence for the arguments that we have reached a post new wave uh, era because um, the audience have turned towards the, the more popular film genres uh, and are supporting local films. Uh, but how accurate is this? Uh, I've compiled a, a, a table here, right? So if you look at 2008, Cape Number no. Seven did help to push the domestic market share, uh, market share of the domestic films to over 10%. But it dropped back down to the very low 2.3% the following year, and then went up a bit more in, to 7.31% uh, in 2010. So between 2011 and 2015, those were the five years when the domestic Films market share uh, went over the 10% mark, but they have dropped back down to under 10% in the three recent years whose records I can find. Right, so empirically, uh, how accurate is this? Uh, I, I'm throwing a question mark uh, as to whether post new wave really signals uh, a, a resurgence of kind of popular cinema and an audience supporting uh, local films. Right, I'm putting the question mark there. Okay. Uh, all right, another way, of course, of, of uh, kind of trying to understand the post new wave era is by genre. And I'm, I, I know that some speakers will be talking about this later, so I'm not going to touch it. But there are 
556 films from that table, 2008 to 2018. So how does one actually, you know, categorize uh, films by genre uh, is a challenge that I won't venture, but will leave to other speakers. So finally, very quickly, my own take, right? So uh, out of this body of films, you know, over 500 films, uh, I have detected a, 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 a trend that I find is a prominent trend, uh, is what we call Xiao Qing Xin or later freshness. Uh, and I basically argue that the shift from the new wave period to the post new wave period is a change in the structure of feeling, right? What Raymond Williams called structure of feeling uh, from the more, you know, loaded heavy historical sentiments uh, to a kind of light fluffy uh, uh, structure of feeling uh, which is called uh, little freshness and and this actually has a lot of context behind it which i don't have time to go into but you are more than welcome to check out um, the article that I published in 2019 uh, which covers this area and finally one final point just to be provocative if you want to talk at talk about the really popular Taiwan cinema. There is a body of films that, as, I'm, as far as I'm, con as I'm aware, no film historiography has really written about them very seriously. And this is the comedy films starring Zhu Ge Liang, for those of you who know uh, this Taiwanese comedian, right? He has starred in at least five films since 2011 that, that have all broken the holy grail of box office record, which is the EE, uh, Tai Bi. Right, 100 million uh, new Taiwan dollar mark. And yet, as far as I know, uh, nobody has actually talked about how do we you know, uh, deal with this body of films in relation to Taiwan film history or film historiography. Right, so I thought I'll just uh, throw that out. Uh, and uh, just finally to plug my book. <laughs> so I'm currently uh, wrapping up a book manuscript called Taiwan Cinema as Soft Power. And uh, uh, if I finish it you know, around Christmas time, hopefully it will come out, uh, it will be published by 2022 and it's forthcoming with Oxford University Press. Okay, thank you all for your attention and I uh, look forward to a discussion later. Thank you. Fantastic. Okay. So I won't have any PowerPoint. I'm not as organized as uh, Professor Lim. Uh, and thank you, Professor Lim, and, and BU for what you said before. Indeed, um, when uh, BU brought this topic, I was really interested, but also because I had a lot of questions. Because what we just heard from Professor Lim introduction is that there is a kind of uh, big difference of what is thought as being post new cinema in Taiwan, which is, I think, most of the time. Uh, yeah, it, it appeared because of uh, CAP number seven, so it was more something in terms of uh, popular success rather than um, film aesthetics. And I think that was a big difference with what was happening mm -hmm. before. And uh, for me, and I think maybe for you, maybe you can uh, tell about more a little more about it. For me, it was just a kind of... Um, strange way of, of defining like in the West, uh, we only see Taiwan cinema as Taiwan new cinema and then we ignore what's coming afterwards. And for example, in France, I don't know uh, in other countries, but uh, we are completely uh, limited to these uh, new waves directors, which are for France, Ho Xiaoxian and Tsai Ming-liang and Edward Yang when he was alive. And when we see new directors from Taiwan's cinema, they have to be linked to this new cinema. So when a Taiwanese film is distributed, like Punang uh, Mayoni, No Puedo Bibi Sinti, for example, by Leon Dai, um, I was asked to do the introduction and, and really I was asked to link the film to Taiwan new cinema. It was something very important for the distributor, for example, and for, for the French audience, like the French audience has to be reminded like Taiwan cinema is still in this uh, new cinema tradition. And when films are not in this tradition, it's like uh, confusing for uh, our um, critics. And I think also for our uh, researcher, uh, it might, there might be a big difference, I think also in France and in English speaking countries uh, and Asia, of course, because uh, as you may know or not, uh, people working on Taiwan cinema, I'm not saying on Chinese cinema, 
most of the time do not speak Chinese. So there is a kind of uh, linguistic uh, limitation too, I think, to, to that. So they are focused uh, in France. We are really focused on Taiwan new cinema because that are the films that have been distributed in France and that are accessible to, 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 to us. So that's why there is this kind of limit. And we see the same limit in terms of film programming um, um, in, in festivals. Uh, you will see that most of the Taiwanese films that are shown in festivals now, uh, well, we don't have so many. And uh, there, is, there was a kind of a shift uh, from this, or you have Ho Xiao Xian or Tsai Ming Liang being uh, chosen in big festivals, like they, they know they can go to Cannes or to Venice, or uh, there is a shift, and I think uh, Corrado and or even Professor Chen are going to speak about that. For example, Zhong Mong Hong was invited uh, with parking uh, uh, in 2005, I think, uh, at a director's fortnight, and it was a new role. So we see that now Taiwanese cinema, when it is um, selected in festival, it's more into genre festival, and there is a shift. So or it's genre film, so fantastic film festivals, or kind of things, or it's in more documentaries now and short films. Now um, it's as if the Taiwan um, liveness in creation is not so much now for festival into the feature films, but for the short films and the documentaries. So I think we have this uh, shift here about like the post new cinema that is for me more uh, a convenient term to make a difference, but does not have a real uh, definition in terms of, um, of aesthetics or being a group or anything. It's more like, yes, being in opposition or just after another period, okay, after the, all the masters of the 80s. Um, so yeah, that was my, my, my few questions and comments, like to be just see Taiwan post new, like, post new cinema just as a chronological um, definition or yes, I think other people are going to answer uh, in terms of maybe aesthetics and genre and particularities for that. But for festival, we can see that uh, until now, it's not really relevant because most of the young directors, uh, except for the genre directors, find how to find a place uh, in, in festivals and even more in big festivals, even if they try. Thank you. Oh, thank you very much. Okay, thanks, uh, Wafa. Uh, it's really uh, interesting to, to hear uh, from a very different uh, perspective, uh, especially from French. You know, you guys are the inventor of new wave, isn't there? So everyone was using that term to, to indicate certain kind of uh, change and revolutionary sort of uh, cinema making. So yes, thank you very much. It's great. Um, our next speaker is uh, uh, Dr. Chen Bingquan. Bingquan, it's over to you. OK, thank you, Biyu. And uh, for my presentation, very mini pre presentation this afternoon, I would like to share some uh, kind of my personal observation. Uh, while I was walking uh, and talking about uh, the characteristics of the film directors after the Taiwan New Cinema era. Yeah. So while I was working as a director of the Taiwan Film Institute, which was now become the Taiwan Film and the Audiovisual Institute, one of my aim was to promote Taiwanese films within international markets. And we aim to promote a variety of films, whether they be mainstream movies or cinema classics, such as Taiwanese language cinema, Tai Yu Pian, uh, Wu Xia, martial arts films, or the melodramas of the 1970s and uh, 1980s. In order to promote our products, we set up uh, the Taiwan Cinema Pavilion in Busan, in Berlin, and Kaunas, where film festival programmers, foreign investor, uh, investors or contributors could come and learn more about the films that they were interested in. They had the opportunity to meet people who meet, uh, who be involved with the film's production and also film agents from Taiwan. 
and the many of these business relationships were also genuine uh, friendships, just like uh, where I met uh, Wafa. Yeah. For most of my friends in the international film industry, Taiwan's national cinema had uh, fas uh, fascinated them since the emergence of Taiwan new cinema in 1980s. However, I always had the sense that while well, they are talking about contemporary Taiwanese film, Taiwan new cinema itself was bygone era, having ended around 30 years ago. And there was a generation of film directors who came after that, who were in their 40s or 50s, who were the pillars of current Taiwan cinema. But these Taiwanese film lovers often still cherished Taiwan new cinema, seeing it as the general uh, <coughs> paradigm of Taiwanese cinema as a whole. These films, which focused primarily on artistry and were highly commended in film competitions. Of course, I'm not saying that uh, it is negative for Taiwan to be known for its art house films. It's possible that even though some Asian films may be produced for commercial reasons, by the time they reach the eyes of Western moviegoers, because of the different cultural context, they might be seen as an art house film regardless. As a film professional, I wonder why uh, 30 years after Taiwan new cinema, the contemporary appearance of Taiwanese films and their directors does not seem to be recognized by professionals outside of Taiwan widely or be discussed comprehensively by Taiwanese film professionals or even audiences. Nor did Taiwanese cinema ever seem to return to that so-called golden era of the 1970s and 1980s in terms of box office uh, revenue. But can be argued that in the three decades of development after Taiwan new cinema, there has been significant development in terms of the shape of the industry, the aesthetics used and uh, the authorship of films, especially in the authorship of films compared to previous generations, which is uh, Taiwan new cinema. Maybe the definition of the post new uh, post Taiwan new cinema or Taiwan post new cinema generation is still vague, though it is difficult to find the reasons why this generation is not uh, identified. Possibly, it might be because the territories of the Taiwan's film circle, Taiwan the Ding Chun, might be a sector with uh, boundaries that are blurred. We do need more research to clarify whether or not we have certain historical uh, category or generation that could be called Taiwan post new cinema or post Taiwan new cinema. But for this conversation, I would just like to share some of my observations. And uh, also can recall to uh, the Wafa or uh, Professor Lim Songhui. Uh, now, while there are issues in, in, in defining the territory of contemporary Taiwanese cinema, that generation of directors now 40 or 50 years old, uh, they are not that really young when you are saying uh, the relatively young generation in my perspective. So in terms of the film his history, I suggest that uh, there are three characteristics that make up these Taiwan post new cinema authors and could allow them to be seen as a collective group within the Taiwan film history context. For starters, many directors have had multiple careers. After the 1980s, Taiwan's domestic film industry uh, faced a decline. So the directors of the post-new cinema period survived in the film industry by having multiple careers. If we take uh, Zhong Monghong, for example, he worked as director on advertisements. In 2002, he established his own production company 
which produced television advertisement and music videos. It could be, uh, it would be six years after in 2008 that when he would release his first debut film, uh, Parking Tingche, the film received numerous uh, notice from international festivals and uh, won the Best uh, Screenplay Award at the Taipei Film Festival in 2009. Zhong Hong himself won Best Director. Now, uh, Zhong said in an interview that he ended his career in advertising after another film of his, God Speak, uh, Illusion Bone won the Best Feature Length Film Award at the Golden Horse Awards in 2016, with he himself winning Best Director at the same award. However, that means that he was in the advertising industry for 14 years, although he uh, received so many uh, very important film awards. Another example is uh, Zheng Youjie, his feature length Debut to over Nian Zhi Chu won the Million Award at the Taipei Film Festival in 2006, and the film was nominated by uh, at the Busan and the Tokyo International Film Festival too. However, Cheng has also worked as a director in television and advertising for many years. He directed the television miniseries Days We Star at the Sun uh, in 2010. In addition, Lin Shuyu and Ho Jiran have also had diverse careers in advertising, music videos, and documentaries after their feature length film debuts established them in Taiwan's film circle. Secondly, many post new cinema directors have used documentary making as their stepping stone using it to acquire the opportunity to make a feature length. I have argued in previous research that uh, the key characteristics of Taiwan independent documentaries in the early 2000s were the young filmmakers' innovations in using digital home camera and the personal computers with the subsequent low budget independent documentaries being their debut creations. Some of these documentaries earned a positive reputation and a credibility, meaning that these young filmmakers could then attract the investment or government subsidies they require to make feature length films. For instance, Huang Xinyao, who direct uh, Buddha Plus, Dafo Plus, which came out in 2017, was an established independent documentary maker and had been for most of his career before making his feature length debut. His documentaries have received many awards, including at the Type 1 International Documentary Festival and the uh, uh, Taipei Film Festival. And Zhong Monghou, uh, who we just talked about previously, the independent documentary Dr. Yi in 2006, before he met his feature debut, uh, Ting Che. He even won the Best Documentary Award at Taipei Film Festival. Uh, Ho Jiran also met several independent documentaries before his uh, 2010 debut film, One Day, Yu Tian. In 2003, he met his first documentary, Stardust, uh, 15749001, uh, what a name of the film, which won the Million Award at the Taipei Film Festival. His second documentary, My 747, drew international attention at the 2005 Busan International Film Festival. And this documentary on Elvent to the post new cinema directors is very similar to my first argument regarding these directors having diverse or multi careers. And third, and finally, there is a struggle between artists 
uh, creation and commercial achievement for those uh, uh, post new cinema era the, uh, directors. A lot of research has been done regarding the commercial aspect of Taiwan new cinema and uh, uh, the film industry at the time, trying to work out why the industry deteriorated the way it did at the end of the new cinema period. Directors in the post new cinema period therefore found themselves in a difficult situation. They were given little in terms of opportunities from both private sector and the government supported film studios. Uh, this meant that when they were given the chance to develop a feature length film, they were faced with a struggle. Do they make an uh, artistic film which wins international acclaim, similar to their uh, predecessor doors? Or should they make a, doc a commercial successful film that please investors when it comes to the box office, thereby securing more opportunities to make films? This dilemma could be seen as an inherent characteristic of uh, directors after Taiwan New Cinema. Of course, for the authors that come after the Taiwan New Cinema era, they may not have all these three uh, characteristics uh, that I have mentioned. However, if we view them as collective group for the perspective of Taiwanese film history, then these characteristics become wider influence on a generation of filmmakers as a whole. The authors that came after Taiwan New Cinema definitely have their own voice, different from the previous uh, paradigm and have created a new phase of Taiwan's contemporary film. Okay, I, <laughs> I know, maybe time. Thank, Thank you. Thank you very much. It's great um, giving us an overview of the a newer generation, younger generation directors. Thank you so much, Bing Chen. Um, Thank, you. Thank you. Now uh, we are going to move on to Corrado. Corrado, it's yeah. over to you. Thank you. Is it okay? Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, uh, thank you. So I'd like to, actually, I wanted to participate with more a question um, than answer, and especially focusing on, well, we, we've been mentioning um, horror movies or popular movies. Um, so now I'll center on Les Game and, and, and horror movie as a question. So can we find a particular strain of, um, of movie, namely um, working on the horror genre? And is it a, a characteristic or could be seen as a characteristic of the um, uh, part of the Taiwan new post new cinema? Um, there is nothing new under the sun. We know we've been uh, working uh, with, with many of you with, with, with the Tatai Yupian and we've been showing Bright from Hell or also in your great um, series now of the, of the Taiwan a new cinema event, we've seen the documentary uh, on, on the Hoi Dien, so Black Society. So um, I, I'm not saying that the horror or violence or genre movie are specifically of this new generation, but yet uh, I think there are some, um, some common elements and, and that the horror popular genre could be seen as um, one of the more maybe original or interesting in terms of soft power, I'm very curious to read your book as soon as it's, 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 it's published, um, as well as um, uh, interrelation between art and, um, and, 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 and box office. Um, and actually this question came also because I've got questions from my students, for example, they see a lot of things of new Taiwan cinema without no, knowing for sure uh, that would be my uh, my role as a teacher, but they see a lot of things on the Netflix, for example, which could be an interesting way also to analyze it, to analyze uh, the, the diffusion of these new movies for a younger or a global audience. I am referring now to uh, TV shows that have been shown in TV in Taiwan, but are, are, are on the Netflix uh, catalog now. 
uh, Green Door, Nowhere Man, or uh, Victim's Game, which could be maybe the more closer to the, whole, the horror genre. But also, it just been released a few days ago uh, on the Netflix, um, The Ghost Bridge, uh, Nu Guai Tiao. So, uh, so trying to answer the student asking me, so is it a new trend? I was running through my files and I found um, a, a conference that, uh, uh, um, a, a conference paper that I gave a few years ago. And I'd like to read you very, the first lines of the abstract. So I'll try not to, to, go, to dwell um, too deep into it, but um, I think it's, it's interesting because in 2015, a, a paper about uh, tag along, so uh, Hong Yi Xiao Nui Hai, and a tenant's downstairs, uh, Adam Tsui, um, respectively 2015 and 16. Uh, I read just a few lines because there are some hints, I think, of trends that developed in the following years. So the abstract of this uh, horror new horror movies from Taiwan goes like this. Both label horror movies, and here uh, I, I, I think it's an important way to uh, define and aim an audience, uh, soft power in the, in, in the idea of, of, of acquiring soft power, as well as box office, local box office success. So back to my abstract. They are, so Hong Yi and Lao Xia, they are nonetheless extremely different in scope, ambition, distribution, and aesthetic engagement. The first is a small budget production, while the second enjoyed a massive marketing campaign. They both movies, and, and here I, I, I underscore, uh, because well, we see that Chen, Chen Weihao had a, a, a longer career later. They both engage the local market to be confronted with international counterparts, and they both dialogue with repertoire which I use not to um, do too much tradition and literary production. Hong Yixia Nui Hai, in folklore anxieties, transferred in the multimedia, multi-screen surveillance contemporary world. While Tenants is an adaptation of the prolific media exposed to Bada, uh, Giddens Co. The former treasure the lesson of J-horror from the 90s, a genre that was capable to create a global frenzy by dwelling into specific local imaginary readapted to the new technology. Here, the central idea comes from the very popular TV show, Taiwan TV show, about ghosts in the form of reportage. The latter hints at Western classic, like obviously The Tenant by Polanski, or the Japanese imaginary of the Nikatsu Roman Porno, including uh, literary references like Kawabata, Tanizaki, Mishima, Edogawa Rampo, and the like. So this, I stop reading the abstract that goes a little longer. But what I thought interesting in this 2015 kind of ancient uh, article is that we can see something, I think, that has been reproduced uh, both by this um, director and others in the following years. Um, namely, I find um, some elements. For example, uh, a shift from China. What I mean, I, I, I'm aware of the uh, Taiwan and China politics. I mean, uh, there's a ostensibly not considering Chinese market. These horror movies are not going to be um, um, exploited or screened officially in China. So there is already an, an, an idea of not considering the mainland Chinese market and going towards the Pacific. So Japan or South Korean. I've already mentioned the references to the pink ega, uh, highbrow and lowbrow literature, J-horror more specifically, uh, and Korea, of course, the, 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 the huge um, massive production of Korean, South Korean uh, thriller and horror movie. But also um, in terms maybe more of soft power, Western, just international, global interest. These films are telling stories about transgression, technology, angst, uh, the omnipresence of CT CCTV, video recording, video recording, the invasion of social media into the private life. So this strategy to face perceived threats of identity discontinuity, I think 
many other authors, or, 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 or these I mentioned, continued in the following years. So one of the big questions that we always find in defining the Xin Taiwan Xin 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 Taiwan Ho Xin Taiwan is do they create waves? Well, uh, Adam Adam Tsui, not to my knowledge. I think uh, to my knowledge it was his only film as a director, but it was an adaptation of Jiu Ba Dao, who is prolific. He's last written and, and product um, and produced a uh, movie, uh, Da Peng Ti, was just released on the Netflix. So my students are seeing it, but also his underrated uh, Mon 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 Monster, Ba Gao La Si Guai Guai Wu. So Gideon Sko is really going through the uh, Lei Xin Jian and di different declination of um, uh, cinema genre, including horror in this um, uh, uh, it's about school hazing uh, and monster zombie fantastic element. I mentioned Hu Yi Xiao Nu Hai. Chen Wei Hao has a very um, coherent string of film, including the series of Hu Yi Xiao Nu Hai, uh, who he directed the first two, but it's, I think, extremely interesting that the third installment, uh, Ran Mian Yu, it's about a completely different story. So the uh, red dress girl disappears, but there are more folklore related stories, anxieties here, this, uh, this is fish siren monster uh, in the jungle. So for um, uh, Chen Wei Hao, there has been a, a wave or a continuity, a, a coherent aesthetics. Others, and I'm going to my conclusion just to mention that solicit that solicit our attention, I think, are well few zombie movie like the Zombie 108, um, or I mentioned um, the, the Bridge Curse, so Nu Guai Tiao, that again dwell into the tradition, probably an invented tradition, but yet uh, something with a local uh, flavor, but also high school and many true the trope of horror films that are uh, repeated. Again, I won't go back because we had a, a very interesting talk um, and Q&A especially about detention, Fan Xiao, who's uh, again, that is again the first movie, um, the other horror genre reconstructs the anxieties and create visual metaphor for describing martial law repression on thought. So a huge PTSD uh, young adult a horror film, cross media, video games, movie, um, etc. So, an, an extremely contemporary um, uh, uh, movie, but also very specifically Taiwanese, dwelling in the story in the past of um, of Taiwan. And then, just just to end with with a, a last uh, title, um, which I forgot the English name, Tao Chu Li Fa Yuan, Tao Chu Li Fa Yuan. Get out of here, get the hell out of here. But the Chinese title, Li Fa Yuan, a zombie pandemic, Wang uh, Yi Fan Dao Yuan, the uh, zombie pandemic, video game aesthetics, a satire, of course, of the um, political scene, political debate, uh, widespread corruption, mixed with a, a, a postmodern spaghetti western zombie animated video game film. So, this was the last title I want to mention, but uh, but well, it seems to me that there is a one, not the only one, of course, but one of the strain of this post new Taiwan could be mm. in the Lei Xinjiang and especially Kung Fu. Thank you. Thank you so much. It's, it's a fascinating topic. I don't think I ever uh, <laughs> watch any of those. No, <laughs> no. How are you? Ignorant I am. I Thank you for the uh, introduction. I'm definitely going to look out for them. Thank you. So now we have the next speaker is uh, <laughs> Professor Chen. Uh, Robert, it's over to you. Okay, so um, yeah, very nice to uh, have you uh, online right now, and I'm glad to be invited for this uh, roundtable discussion. And following previous presentation, I would like to talk about my observations about some common characteristics of post new wave directors and their film. And then these are some summaries 
about uh, the issues and, and also online I'm going to talk about. First, um, you can see from this slide, uh, three directors been introduced in this program, and so far we have Ho Chi Ran and Lin Su Yu, and then uh, for the later a uh, few couple few days later we will have a uh, Zheng Yu Jie with us, and you can see um, they were all born in um, 1970s, so it means that they grew up watching film made by new way directors Ho Xiao Xian, Edward Yang, etc. In terms of their cinematic learning, however, the difference. Their difference from new world directors is that their growth was not overshadowed by the impact of uh, martial law, which existed from 1949 to 1987. Therefore, films made by uh, post new world directors did not deal directly with taboo subjects, such as white terror or February 28th incident of 1947 or the repression of the KMT regime. So this leads to my Second observation, instead of dealing with heavy, heavy issues such as national identity of Taiwanese from the new world masters, uh, post new world directors started their filmmaking career with personal stories. Um, here I list um, three directors and also their first feature films in their uh, filmmaking career. And you can see like a uh, um, the film made by Lin Su Yu, Winds of September, is about the love of baseball and also used romance. And the other two uh, first films by, made by directors uh, Ho Xi Yan and uh, Zheng Yu Jie are fictional stories by them. And um, my third observation, and I think it's a, the most important one, is that the way for the post New Way directors to present their films is to replace Taipei with Taiwan as their story setting. Generally speaking, new web directors shot Taipei as the center of the world. Uh, Edward Young is a, a prominent example. Every, each of his film is about Taipei. Even for Hou Xiaoxian, his films dealt with characters moving from countryside to Taipei, such as uh, Dust in the Wind. But on the other hand, as you can see from this slide, shooting location for post new world directors were anywhere but Taipei. So we see from one day that uh, the film uh, was shot uh, between the, the there's a ferry boat between Kaohsiung and Kinmen, and also Winds of September uh, was in Xinzhu, where uh, Lin Su Yu, the director, um, took uh, his high school education over there, and also. Um, in uh, in Zheng Yujie's first film, Do Over, Yu Tian, actually the location is not uh, specified in the, in the movie. The trend of looking at Taiwan from non-Taipei perspective actually started with the film Island Attitude. Um, this is this is film is about a young man riding bike and circling around Taiwan, and it's very interesting if you can see from the Taiwan's map on the right side of the screen that starting point for his journey is Kaohsiung, very down, um, the down south of Taiwan Island. And then um, he then moves to east part of Taiwan and then going north. And actually he didn't stop at Taipei. He buys Taipei as if Taipei does not exist in the film and starts going southbound and going back to Kaohsiung. So this is a film that uh, involves a lot of young people in Taiwan, and then they start um, walking around Taiwan. They try to find a new way of looking at Taiwan. And another film um, a lot of presenters have been talking about is uh, Cap Number no. 7 of, of 2008. This film even set up the story at Hengchun, the far south end of Taiwan. And this slide shows a tourist map made by Hengchun city office to promote the tourism. Because at that year, um, a lot of people, a lot of audience after watching Cap Number no. 7, they flocked to, to visit sceneries, places being appeared in Cap Number no. 7. Because of this non taipei perspective, I would like to introduce uh, Director Zhong Mong Hong, as a lot of presenter um, has mentioned him. And I believe this is um, one Director, important director, been 
uh, absent from this program. Um, Zhou Monghong start, started his uh, filmmaking career with a documentary, but uh, he is also the first director for me who not only shot his films, mostly outside of Taipei, he also gives me an imagery of Taiwan that I have, I have not seen before. Taiwan becomes a new territory that for me, or also for a lot of audience, that we need to explore once again after watching his films. Um, so I, I copy some scenes from his film, Godspeed of 2016, and you can see them for yourself. But before that, we can compare um, some uh, urban scenery from Terrorizer by Edward Young. On the left side is the beginning of the, the movie that is a, a lot of uh, apartment house and then very crowded uh, spaces and with only two lanes, uh, low side for, for the, the cars to drive through. And on the right side is a, a gas tank um, in the middle of Taipei, as if uh, implying that uh, Taipei is gonna blow up any moment uh, in this film. So this is a Taipei scenery um, being portrayed in Terrorizer. And then on the other hand, when we look at Godspeed, we find out things like this. And Godspeed actually is a low movie. So um, the, the film starts with a taxi and driving away from Taipei and then goes all the way to, to the southern part of, of Taiwan, like, like in um, like Island Attitude. So it's a, the, the imagery from this film is very on Taipei. It's a, it's a new imagery. And then you can see some other imagery too, like this one. The way he shows highway is the first of a kind I have seen in 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 Taiwan cinema, and also another ways of another angles of of shooting um, highway is like this highway is in the middle of the rice field on both sides, and then uh, he also captures. Uh, some uh, some places I had never been there. Actually, it's in the middle part of, of Taiwan, and then um, it's kind of exotic and very strange for me to find out that uh, Taiwan has this kind of place. And then also again, uh, around the same area, we can find out there's a pond or lake on both sides of a very narrow and crowded uh, road. And also, um, Another another uh, scenery from from Godspeed also uh, new to me and I believe is also new to a lot of uh, people. And then uh, another high angle shot to show the taxi um, uh, in the in the middle of nowhere. Um, it's really difficult to find out or di difficult to believe this is this is in Taiwan, and this is the last picture, and also actually is the last shot from um, uh, Godspeed and they find out uh, after taxi comes to the in the middle of nowhere, it's, it's like uh, the two characters, two main characters in this film are in are nowhere to go and they really don't know how to go. And I think I can look at it as a, as a metaphor to um, in a way of, of replying uh, the previous presenters question about how are we going to define uh, those post new wave cinema and also those uh, post new wave uh, directors. It might be a signal from Zhou Monghou saying they are trying to figure out the new direction for Taiwan cinema. So I really hope that uh, later on probably we can have a more discussion about the possibility to find out the way for the uh, Taiwan cinema. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Robert. Um, it, it's so comprehensive and within the time frame, it's amazing. I was a bit worried about the 17 slices, but a slide, but there we go. You, you, you're professional, you, you did it. Um, <laughs> okay. Um, I'm sure now is uh, Chris. Um, Chris, would you like to come? All right, so thank you very much. Um, Thank you, uh, David, BU, Max, Charlie, everybody else for putting together this event, which has made me think about a lot of things. Um, I suppose I want to make three comments um, about 
so-called post new wave um, as my contribution. And uh, I think maybe it's going to overlap a little bit with what some other people have said. And I apologize if it does. Um, I try not to be too boring. Um, I think over the last um, couple of the last couple of weeks and also today, the first thing I want to say is that I'm very struck by the continuing power of Taiwan new cinema and Taiwanese new wave. Um, you know, even the naming of this event, the naming of this group of filmmakers and so on, uh, on one level, it declares it's over, but on another level, because we're still calling it post new wave, new wave is still here. It's still the constant frame of reference that is being used. And I think, um, although, you know, we are trying very hard to find some common characteristics and say what this this new thing is, um, maybe we're, we're not very clear. Um, and I was very moved listening to some of the directors' Q and A's to realize how strong the aura of the Taiwanese new wave directors continue to be. Last week, for example, when Tom Lin uh, Lin Shui, sorry Lin Shui, was uh, remembering Ho Xiaoxian working on the editing of younger directors' films, including his own films. I thought that was a very interesting little account he gave. And um, it testifies on one level to how, you know, Taiwan cinema is a quite a small scene, but also the incredible rever reverence that people have for that earlier generation. And I was also very, when he said near the beginning of his talk about I'm um, sitting around with his friends in the same generation and asking themselves, are they in, in the circle, you know, or not? Are they actually filmmaking people or not yet? Um, and I thought that was very interesting. Again, suggesting this power that um, the image of the Taiwan new cinema filmmakers have. And of course, the next thing to, to talk about is the way in which the Taiwan new cinema model is powerfully informed by auteurism. So I guess the second point I want to ask is, do we have to think always in terms of auteurism? And of course, already um, we've had the question of genre being raised this afternoon. Um, I, I think that there's no question that the auteur model is, is a useful one, and that's we saw that also last week with Dr. Lin Ting Ying's presentation, where she really did a great job of using the idea of the auteur and their signatures and that sort of idea to uh, enable us to get a deeper understanding of filmmakers. And, and Robert Chen, uh, Professor Chen just now, I think also highlighting some really important um, stylistic character and thematic characteristics. But I think we also need to recognize that the production system itself has changed. And maybe to get a really uh, better understanding of what's going on these days, um, we need to focus on, on that a little bit. Um, you know, we're aware that in the 60s and 70s, um, the, it was a, a, a classical studio-based industry a commercial industry. And so the way of classifying films in that period would very much be in terms of genre. And then as people have pointed out in the 80s with the death of the commercial industry and the growth of incentives, the government wanting recognition internationally and giving prize money for winning awards in international film festivals. Of course, because international film festivals want auteurs, you get the development of an auteur cinema. But those eras are over. Um, and what do we have now? Um, what is the uh, political economy, if you will, of Taiwanese uh, filmmaking today? And this is really where we come to the term I suggested as a kind of title for my talk when BU asked me for a title, 
which is you know the cinemas of small nations under globalized globalization. Um, so first of all, let me acknowledge that this idea of small nations is a, a been circulating for a while now. And um, as Songhui mentioned earlier, and I was going to mention it too, and I had it, um, I thought, oh, shall I make a slide? But I didn't need to because Songhui did already. Um, he has this chapter called Taiwan New Cinema, Small Nation with Soft Power. And so this idea of the power dynamics of small nations has already been used to talk about Taiwan New Cinema. Um, but what about the post-New Cinema era? And Probably the most important work uh, is by the Danish scholar Meta Hjort, uh, who uh, works at Lingnan in Hong Kong and wrote a book called Small Nation Global Power, the New Danish Cinema, already 15 years ago. And so I think she's the pioneer in thinking about the impact of small nations, cinema and globalization. Um, and I think when we talk about globalization, we're talking about the, the dominance of the nation state giving way to a more multi-layered, complex, diffuse system. And this system works through a global, regional level, a national level, and then also a local level. And I think we need to begin to focus a bit more on understanding how that system works if we want to think about the, the post-TNC era or whatever we want to call it and, and how Taiwan cinema is in that era. So let me give a few, just a few examples from those different levels. I think if we're talking about a global level, of course, the International Film Festival Network continues to operate, continue to look for auteurs, art cinema. And so someone like Midi Z is someone who gets very much discovered and circulated on that level. But it's also there these days in the art world, the actual gallery art world. No contemporary art exhibition today is complete without moving image works. And that's where, obviously, as we all know, Simon Liang has found uh, a new home and a new way of working. Um, but also other filmmakers, Zero Joe, for example, has made gallery works as well. And I'm sure there are many others. Then the regional level. Um, I think the horror movies that Corrado was talking about participate in a kind of Asian horror phenomenon. And that phenomenon, that brand, is one that marks a certain kind of regional grouping and circulation. And it's also... Uh, a way of marketing the films globally. Um, perhaps Asian queer romances, which Taiwan is also a major producer of, maybe that's also a kind of regional genre. Um, it's a question, I'm not sure. The national level also continues to operate. Um, and in commercial cinema, I think one of the interesting things about small nations is the audiences in small nations still very much want local stories told. And as a result, each of them is able to sustain one or two major commercial filmmakers who make big box office hits, but box office hits that don't usually circulate beyond that um, national or quasi-national territory. And in Taiwan, I guess that's Wei De Sheng. Um, in Hong Kong these days, Perhaps it's someone like Johnny Toe. Um, in Singapore, for a long time, it was Jack Neo. Sadly, here in the UK, we don't have a filmmaker like that at the moment. And the National also operates through various government funding schemes for short films, documentaries, and so on, often um, operated at arm le arm's length through independent funding bodies. Um, and then finally, a local level. Well, for example, last week, we also heard um, Tom Lin talk about how city-based funding from Kaohsiung and other cities led him to set his films or see certain sequences in his films in certain cities. So you can see how the local level and the desire to bring film production to cities and to 
create an image for those cities through cinema, shapes filmmaking as well in certain ways. So finally, um, if we're going to consider Taiwan under this framework of cinema of small nations under globalization, is there anything special to say about the way that model operates in, in Taiwan? Uh, I'm not sure. I think there's probably a lot more research to be done. But there's one thing that I have noticed, and I think a lot of the things that the other speakers have been saying this afternoon and drawing attention to sort of resonates with that. And that is that, um, of course, at one time, the Taiwan New Cinema was criticized for allegedly um, not being connected enough to Taiwanese audiences. But I think that um, with uh, the post New Cinema, the main feature is whether it's in terms of popular film, whether it's in terms of documentaries, films that are directed towards a certain audience, like indigenous um, films, um, or whether it's uh, queer cinema or whatever, the filmmakers and the films are very much focused on engaging with various different Taiwan audiences. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Chris. It's such a amazing areas of uh, fantastic um, um, talks here. Um, may I ask our panelists to um, switch on your video and audio? Then we can start uh, taking questions. I won't uh, deprive our um, audience uh, with all the time because we, we have limited time. So could um, Xiao Yi come in and uh, take over the Q&A session? OK, so maybe I'll read out the question first. Um, so this is a question from our audience, um, Timmy Chen to Professor Lim. So uh, he would like to know um, why the box office poison discourse in Taiwan new cinema has shifted to the box office savior discourse in post new wave cinema. Um, so, and this might be related to uh, Bing Chen's point of some of the post new cinema directors having diverse and multiple careers. Right. Okay. Would, uh, would uh, Song Hui want me to uh, show it now or later? Yes, yep. Well, if you want me to reply now, then please. Okay. Yes, um, then you have to wait a little bit. Okay, for sure. Start. Well, I can always start talking. <laughs> yeah, yes, please do. Yeah, sure. Um, yes, thanks, Timmy, for the question. Um, I think um, the box office savior discourse, which is Wei Sheng, is used precisely to attack the box office poison discourse. Uh, that is about um, you know the the new the new cinema people. Um, so let me show you this slide, which I skipped earlier. Uh, and again, I apologize that it's only in Chinese. So in the 1980s, the supporters of the new wave movement were attacking the generation of filmmakers that came before them, claiming that their films have led Taiwan film industry into a cul-de-sac. Right, a uh, 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 no end road. And later, the detractors of new cinema, the people who attack new cinema, use exactly the same term of cul de sac, claiming that the new cinema has taken Taiwan film industry or Taiwan cinema into the cul de sac of art cinema. So you can see here that the discourse is the same, but the target is different. So what this tells us is actually how such discourses are, like I said earlier, you know, it's, it's an ideological battle. It's about uh, discursive power. It's about who gets to say or define film historiography in whose terms, right? So it's not so much whether these things are empirically proven, right? As I have shown in my uh, other slide, uh, that you know, the, the, the box office market share it's actually not as huge as it's been claimed, you know. Uh, but but yet this this myth this myth of Wei De Sheng being the savior of Taiwan cinema, you know, somehow lives on in the discourse of post Taiwan cinema. 
So, so this is my, my, my response to, to the question. And if I may actually, um, do you want me to stop here? Can I ask a question in response to the presentations or make a comment in response to the presentations earlier? Be you. Um, yes, okay. Yeah, because I, I don't think there are that many questions yet, so I can pose a question or make a comment myself if that is fine. Yes. Yes, okay. So yes. Uh, just, very, just very quickly, uh, kind of in response to uh, what Wafa, Ping Chuan and Chris Berry all touched upon, right? I think on the international film festival market, right, authorship is the currency, right? But as we all know, uh, films, and also, so the question is, how do Taiwanese films travel abroad? Right, the, the three things that usually travel, or, or three things in which films are categorized. One is author, the second one is genre, and the third one is stars. Right, and as we know, Taiwan did have regional film stars, you know, back in the 70s, like Bridget Lin, right, uh, and, and all these other stars, but now there are no recognizable so called film stars, right, from Taiwan, really. So, so you're down to genre or, or, or authors. And, and my understanding is that, uh, and you feel free to disagree, authors travel better at the international level and genres can travel at the international level, but because the Taiwan genres are not as well known as the wuxia and the Kung Fu genres, they travel better in the regional level. So, which is why I picked up this um, genre called Little Freshness, which can be interpreted as a kind of campus movies. And actually some of the actors that appeared in those movies have become really big stars regionally, right? Like Wang Dalu, who starred in the Shaolin Shidai, he became really, really big in China, right? So, so they do operate, but at a different scale, right? Which is why my, uh, hence my argument about the scaling down of soft power from the international scale in the new cinema period to the regional scale, scale in the post new cinema period. Okay, I thought I'll, I'll add that comment uh, okay. to the discussion. Fantastic. Um, can I can I ask uh, Xiao Yi to uh, close the PowerPoint? And uh, um, I I saw Wafa and Chris uh, raised your hands. Uh, but the question is uh, posed to Song Hui and Bing Chen. May we ask Bing Chen to come back to respond to it? Then we come back to to Wafa and and Chris, please. Bing Chen. Okay. Thank you, Bing. Um, yes, I think um, for most of film, especially during the Taiwan New Cinema era, um, we see there are a lot of uh, films that they can be shown or they win the international competition in the International Film Festival, uh, just right because the author, yeah, not because the genre or perhaps we don't have star anymore. Um, However, I think um, for those uh, films, probably for the directors of those films, they are still trying to do something related to the genre or even make the, the box office successfully uh, within the domestic uh, film market in Taiwan. So probably they see uh, bring uh, brought uh, those films, I mean, uh, those uh, new cinema films or the post new cinema films to the international competition as kind of the strategy for winning the attractions uh, from the domestic film uh, audiences in Taiwan or sometimes maybe outside Taiwan, but mostly in, inside Taiwan. So I think um, it's quite a dilemma which I mentioned, just like um, most of the new directors uh, in the after uh, Taiwan New Cinema era, they choose to uh, different kinds of careers, uh, try to secure their uh, professional career, and also try to uh, elaborate or try to touch uh, different angles, aspects in terms of how to make uh, the films in different approaches. Uh, and uh, is successful in the film market. So I don't know whether I answered uh, the Timmy Chen's question. However, that's kind of my observation in terms of uh, <clears throat> the film industry uh, between the Taiwan new cinema and also after the era of Taiwan new cinema. Yeah, thank you. 
Thank you. Uh, uh, Robert, can you switch on your uh, video as well? So the picture will be nicer. <laughs> Sorry. And um, Wafa, would you like to come in first? Then, uh, uh, then okay, just, just a few things uh, to answer maybe Professor Lim. Uh, and I will talk like uh, Ping Chuen from my experience. Uh, talking with all the directors who started their career in the 90s, uh, one told me that really in the 90s, festival would just grab their film, no matter what it was. And we can see that in many festivals, there are some kind of trends. So sometimes it's Taiwan cinema, it's going to be sometimes South American cinema. Now we can see that Chinese cinema is very in fashion. This uh, uh, artistic independent cinema is much more in fashion now. And um, there is also, uh, so on the one hand, there is this trend from the festival, but also when you speak to some directors in Taiwan and who want the film to be taken in festivals, the only festival they see is Cannes or maybe Venice or maybe Berlin. But if you tell them, well, maybe, you know, Hoshia Ocean started in Nantes and uh, Midi Z started in Nantes and then it went to uh, Cannes, they just refused. Uh, I've been talking to them and even working with some of them. They, they, the strategy is can or nothing. And they don't, some of them do not have um, in mind what is made outside. Like, for example, Adam Sway for uh, the tenants downstairs. He wanted can or nothing. And he had no idea of what was expected there. Um, and even uh, Great Buddha Plus, they wanted can. They almost got there. Uh, the, the, the programmer, the curator told me it was almost good, but then no, uh, there are some better films. So I think there is this, this kind of chain of attitude and you can see for some younger directors, they try to attract, attract the, the attention of festival using some, you know, um, magic word like produced by Ho Xiaoxian or music by Lim Gyeong or using some actors like Jack Cao or Gui Lun Mei in the film to to attract some attention from the, the curators uh, and film programmers in festival. Because when you discuss with uh, programmers, they say, oh, yes, this film has been produced by it, or there is this actress. And for real, especially in France, I don't know outside France, but I know that in France, it's very important for programmers to all have names they can recognize or still styles they can recognize. If it's uh, like, you know, Midi Z was okay because it was slow with long takes and minimalist, so it was okay. It was more or less like a Ho Xiaoxian somehow or timing young somehow, but when it's too different, uh, film programmers get completely lost and they don't know what it is about. It's like, no, it's not a Taiwan cinema, we know. And um, that's why, for example, where I work at the French Cinematheque, it was okay to do a film retrospective of on film of the 60s, but impossible to do something about new directors. For them, it was too, not, something you can recognize enough. It was too different from what French people are used to. And a lot of audience always tell me that, oh, the film was okay, but it's very different. Like Zhang Zoti is okay because it's a little like uh, uh, new ways, but uh, the new directors now, no, no, impossible. Except yes, for the genre films that are uh, okay. And that's why now, uh, there is a bigger freedom, I think, in documentary film festival and they're really um, happy and curious about films, so Taiwan films can have an opportunity, or the kind of fantastic film festival, which are also very open-minded. And so Taiwan cinema has an opportunity in genre films to be uh, uh, like somehow seen and promoted. Um, I don't know if I answer some question, but yes, Yang Yachu is in the middle. He does a nice film, but no, not uh, recognizable enough for big festivals. Thank you. Chris? Yeah, what I wanted to say actually is a bit similar to what Wafa was saying at the end there. And I think one of the things we have to recognize is that just as everything else has been transformed um, by globalization, so the same is true for the film festival world. And where it used to be about international film festivals and their prizes, and it was only a, about art cinema, right? Now we have a situation where there are all these different circuits. And there are circuits for fantastic film, circuits for documentary film festivals, circuits for LGBTQ film festivals, women's film festivals, you know, you name it. 
Um, and so, in fact, although many Taiwan filmmakers may struggle to get into Cannes, um, maybe they don't need to be so obsessed with Cannes. There are many other ways if you want to go international. Um, and so I think that's, um, and this is true for everybody, not just filmmakers in Taiwan. Um, there are many, many other opportunities. Nonetheless, unfortunately, it's still the case that if you want to be on the front page of the newspapers, well, maybe forget about the newspapers on MSN website or whatever, um, these you have to be win in Cannes, right? It's the only, for, only international film festival that you can guarantee will be reported globally every year. But to think that that's the only film festival that's out there is a mistake, yes. <laughs> mm. May I also uh, ask uh, uh, Corrado and uh, Robert to come in to, on this? Because I think it's always a, 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 a certain kind of uh, myth that uh, if it's a good film, it definitely should be a, a, a box office poison. And this is kind of really a paradoxical way for example, when uh, uh, Tom Lin was talking about uh, um, his film, which film was that? Uh, by, um, it's actually talking about death. It's not a popular. Zinnia flower. Zinnia yes. flower. Yes. Zinnia flower. Mm -hmm. So, uh, could you two also um, talk a little bit about this? OK, um, actually, I would like to address this question from different perspectives, because nowadays there's a non, another actual new platform coming up, which is OTT Netflix. So nowadays I find out some um, new directors among, um, I guess, these global phenomena that uh, they would like to uh, find a spot or get a, the opportunity to show their works, their either short film or official film on a, web, a website on, such as Netflix. So. Uh, if we follow the tradition of trying to be recognized in those international film festivals, that is because those new directors want to be uh, have a spot in the in the film history, right? But if they want to get some money or they want to have some kind of popularity, probably they'll go for the Netflix. So I think, um, especially the, the in the current situation, because of lockdown, because of pandemic, so. I would believe more and more directors will pursue in this direction instead of following the old way of going to film festival to get uh, to be recognized. Mm, interesting. Yeah. Um, Corrado, I think yeah. you want to say something. Well, I'm I'm, I'm not exactly. Um, <laughs> am I on? Yes. Yeah. Yes, you yeah. are on. Okay. No. Um. Actually, I'm, I'm not sure I have an answer or I exactly pinned down the question, but um, but Robert, you've been mentioning Netflix, which is it's extremely interesting, especially as far as I'm concerned or my students are concerned in a European and pandemic context. Um, so Netflix is interesting, but of course you're all very well aware that some movies are just um, uh, selling rights to, to Netflix, for example, uh, John Moho, right? Yeah. The new one is on, on, on Netflix. So there are horror stuff, uh, Bridge Curse, but also the, um, the, the multiple prize winners, um, A Son by uh, John Moho. So that's why where I was seeing all these uh, categories maybe blurred up. And Chris also reminded us that um, uh, J-horror or uh, um, extreme horror, right, have been brands that, that actually were very helpful to uh, diffuse uh, horror or gore movies outside, uh, outside, uh, outside Asia. So I think these, um, these channels might be interesting uh, in, in, in uh, difference, make a difference between the only art can and um, popular streaming platform. Mm. Wafa, you raise your hand. Yeah, just I wanted to add another problem that happened in the last few years. It, it was before Netflix was that uh, only small distributors were interested in Taiwan cinemas. That were not the big ones. That were not Hoshia Hoshia or Simon Liang or even Simon Liang is hard. 
But yeah, the fees, the right for the firms, I remember were really, really high for the distributors. Like they were asking an, a huge amount of money, no matter for distributors, but also for festival. Like every time a festival wanted to screen Taiwan cinema, it was crazy. Mm. Uh, it, it was huge. So I think it was another problem. Like uh, as if Taiwan wanted to follow the Hong Kong example or the Japanese example, but like, yeah, some maybe archive distributors can pay, uh, we are willing to pay for Japanese films that are going to be, going to be expensive, but, you know, mm. more successful. But Taiwan, they tried to use the same uh, strategy, but it didn't work uh, the same because, well, it was not that successful anymore uh, in France. So it was just something to remember too, like for this uh, problem. Jin-Chen, would you like to come in now? Yeah, I would like to share some experience while I was working for Taiwan Film Institute. As I just mentioned in my uh, presentation, we uh, promote uh, the classic titles of Taiwanese film uh, as well, including uh, 1960s uh, Taiwanese language film, which is Tai Yu Pian, and also the melodramas uh, between uh, 17th to 18th, or uh, the Wu Xia Dian, the martial arts films. So I would like to give you an example about the film festival or how the people uh, in Taiwan are uh, obsessed of the film festival while we are promoting those classical uh, masterpieces. Uh, when we restored it, uh, the, the one of the king whose uh, classic uh, title, uh, Legend in the Mountain, San Zhong Chuan Xi, uh, we thought Actually, this uh, quite important uh, film was well known by the public uh, audiences in Taiwan. So we don't need really to do a lot of uh, promotion or something to reintroduce the film. However, for the young generation audiences in Taiwan, or even not that young, the middle aged uh, audiences in Taiwan, they can't really recognize this film properly. So we still sent the film to Ghana, to Cannes, for the International Film Festival, uh, their classical title programs. And luckily we won an award of the Legion in Mountain as the best uh, restored uh, classic film something. Then everyone realized that actually it was, it is a quite wonderful film, no matter it's the classical <laughs> restoration or actually original, is a very, very uh, great film. So as I say that probably is, I, 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 I don't know, it's kind of obsession or um, conventional concept of how we recognize what is the good film or artist film or um, good piece of the director's work. Uh, the, the film film festival sometimes it's just like um, a price or sometimes just like um, the authority to really uh, give a stamp or something on those really wonderful works. So sometimes we just try to utilize the approach uh, as a film festival as kind of strategy to make uh, the audience aware that actually these films are really wonderful thing wonderful works. However, I won't say it always works. Or however, I won't say we always take uh, that kind of approach for promoting uh, those classic titles or even new films. But it still works in some degree. Uh, just like Wafa mentioned, actually, I think even some genre film, if we do it properly in the International Film Festival, and we try to make the programmers uh, who can select some genres, even the classic titles. Still, we can make those uh, genre films uh, kind of new life as a new film, uh, even they are the classical uh, old movies. So that's my kind of insight of reservation according to my Thank previous you. experience. Yeah. Brilliant. Um, uh, we, we still got quite a few questions. Um, because I know Dong Lai is, uh, is another uh, our regular and he's an uh, amazing uh, PhD. Uh, I think he has already graduated. Um, <laughs> I will have to read out his uh, question. He said he would be keen to hear the panelists' thought about the apparent 
divergence between Taiwanese films that are internationally recognized and those that are domestically recognized. Actually, it's relating to what we were talking about. Uh, um, and he said, especially the film awards, for example, Hou Xiaoxian's film continues to do well in both spheres, but others doing well domestically do not seem to enter international juries uh, considerations like uh, Yang Ya Zhe's uh, films, which won a Golden Horse Award uh, several times. Uh, what are the factors you think that prevent the new fact, new faces from Taiwanese cinemas uh, like Yang uh, to be recognized in the West? Who would like to go first? Um, how about Song Hui? <laughs> well, Fei <Dian> Min. <laughs> <laughs> Indeed. Okay. Um, actually, um, I found what Tom Lin said the other day really interesting. He actually said their generation of filmmakers lack the ambition of the previous generation. Uh, and I don't see that as a bad thing, by the way. <laughs> uh, it's just a different, and, and he, he put it down actually to, to what Robert Chen uh, was saying earlier about generational difference, right? Because they are the generation that didn't experience the martial arts period, sorry, martial, martial law period, um, not martial arts period, martial law, <laughs> <laughs> sorry, slip of the tongue, martial law period. So they don't have, you know, the same, um, rage or resistance, you know, or axe to grind in the same way, you know, not the same fire in the valley. Um, but but like I said, so which, which is why I really see this as a as a as an active change. You know, it's a different structure of feeling, right? You know, it's it's about living the the beautiful mundane daily life of Taiwan. <laughs> and yeah, and and um and those things don't maybe don't translate as well or are not what international film festivals are, are looking for. Mm. Yeah, so, so yeah, hence there's a mismatch between the two. Ah, great. <laughs> and Wafa, actually, this is your territory, isn't it? <laughs> In fact, I think that what just uh, Ping Chuan said and even Chris before, there, there is this kind of, uh, you know, yes. of uh, re mirror reflection. When a film goes to Taiwan, uh, to Cannes, for example, it becomes famous in Taiwan. When Ho Xiaoxian started uh, his career, it was still Taiwan new cinema, so he, doesn't, he didn't have such a big pressure to, you know, the film was successful when he started uh, in the early 80s and his film were going to Nott first and then uh, in Venice in 1988 and, and, and afterwards to Cannes. I think it was still a period where he could do the film he wanted and also they were, uh, like the festival lacked like the way he did film, so he already has this aura. And you know now, Ho Xiaoxian know that if he does a film, it's going to Cannes. You know, it's it's, it's known. Like when you speak to directors, they are like doing their film for Cannes, or Cannes is like you know they they, they, they calculate the time so it goes to this mm. or that festival. So they know that for Ho Xiaoxian, Xian is already settled. Mm. Um, for Yang Yach, I think Yang Yach is like this new generation, like uh, Tom Lin or John Yote, all this kind of of directors. Even if John Yote is maybe lit might be a little different, but they really have to tackle and struggle between what they want to do uh, for films and what is um, what the production wants. You have this, for example, with uh, Xu Hanqiang with Detention. He had an idea of a film and he had to do something else. Uh, well, anyway, so uh, and because festivals are now so formatted, Taiwan cinema must be slow, with no, maybe not so much music, except for Lim Gyeong. If you have Dachau, it's even better. Uh, you know, like, especially big festivals such as Cannes, it's really hard to see new people, except mm -hmm. maybe in the director's fortnight or a certain regard. Or, but um, so those young directors, when you see Yang Yaj, uh, girlfriend, boyfriend, it's mm -hmm. girlfriend, boyfriend, yeah. It's, it's quite interesting because I, I remember discussing with him about the film he wanted to do which was much more political and blah, blah, blah. And when I saw the result and it was sentimental and I was like, what's happening? Uh, so there is always this discrepancy between what the directors want and what at the end uh, is the result. So, in, and festival, I think 
might feel that. And and also, you know, in Taiwan, some productions goes to Taiwan, production goes to Taiwan with the actors, they take pictures there. The film is not in Cannes, but you know, they take pictures in Cannes and then it's in the newspaper in Taiwan. So it's also a way of doing some advertisement uh, somehow. So I don't know. Thank you. It's, it's really good uh, to get some insight from the insiders. Um, Robert also uh, raised his uh, hands. Yeah, um, I'd like to follow what uh, Chris just mentioned. That, um, um, since we are Taiwan as a small nation, we uh, really need to um, find out the way or the, the direction we are going to going forward. So I think the, um, for the uh, new web directors, their mission is to recognize uh, to to have Taiwan been recognized internationally. And on the other hand, I believe the mission for those post new web directors, I mean their mission is to bring back our domestic audience first. Since mm -hmm. after up to uh, 2008, Captain Number Seven, this is a phenomenon, and I believe. That's one thing they learn from Witherson instead of from um, new web directors such as Ho Xiaoxian. So they find out this is important for the domestic, the national audience, national cinema needs to have national audience. That's what uh, uh, very important things, right? So so because of different missions and then, so right now they might be focusing on bringing back our domestic audience. And on the other mm -hmm. hand, uh, I just find out uh, from Bin Chen's talk that Actually, those directors we are we have been talking about in terms of uh, uh, posting web directors, they are almost entering their middle age, and I believe <laughs> uh, they are getting more and more mature. And I believe they will be mature in terms of their film technique and all subject matters. And eventually, or hopefully, they will be recognized by by film festivals in the long run. Yeah. Thank you, Chen, You you want to say something? Yeah. So. Please don't call them young directors anymore. <laughs> Younger. <laughs> Younger, okay. <laughs> I think everyone's still quite younger, relatively young, yeah. Yes, so yes. Um, I respond to uh, Chris and Robert and Wafa. I think uh, for those younger <laughs> generation directors, they are still quite uh, in kind of dilemma. Uh, just like uh, Robert said, uh, probably uh, when they are getting matured, actually, they are more like to know where should they uh, situate their own uh, career, no matter in the commercial side or the artistic side. However, I would like to give another example in terms of the documentary making. I think uh, in documentary making, uh, slightly or entirely is another story. Yeah, for documentary making, uh, we always see it's kind of uh, social engagement uh, for making documentary, uh, try to uh, establish kind of uh, a national or domestic or uh, social political uh, uh, step, uh, establishment or discourse. However, in Taiwan, uh, in the past um, many years, maybe after 2000s, uh, for some kind of uh, production, they have kind of the direction, uh, which is they try to learn or try to analyze how to uh, uh, use a kind of language, if we, we, we can say that, uh, film language or uh, the, the, the image language to mimic uh, the documentary that comes from outside Taiwan, for instance, National Geographic or Discovery Channel. So it's very interesting because uh, in the past many years, we can see that in the territory of documentary making uh, for some uh, independent documentary makers or for some uh, production companies in terms of documentary making, they try to uh, convert their own language uh, in terms of film image into kind of global language, if we may call that, if we, we do have kind of global language and try to make their documentary more like uh, the Western style or specifically fitly saying uh, American style or even the BBC like documentaries. So I think it's a little bit interesting or ironic uh, phenomenon for the filmmaking uh, in general in Taiwan. Uh, perhaps just like uh, Robert mentioned in his uh, presentation that for the post Taiwan New Cinema era, 
uh, most of the directors they try to find out their own voice or or try to show their own uh, characteristics in different aspects. However, in documentary making, of course, still now in Taiwan, the independent documentary are quite strong and try to uh, uh, show their own voice. But in some part of the documentary making in Taiwan, now they are trying to convert themselves, becoming more Western style or the style from outside Taiwan. So that's uh, some other different points. Yeah. In thank the, you. Yeah. Th thank, thank you. you. Uh, uh, I think, oh, okay. I can also see, uh, um, I think how, how we still got quite a few um, questions here. However, I know uh, Corrado uh, want to uh, say something. I'm so sorry, I, I missed that. Uh, now some, some, some not really random thoughts, but question for you and, and, and going back to what I've, I've been said. Um, I'm sorry, this is kind of uh, my... Um, uh, um, we discuss about the specificity of Taiwan, which is, of course, a, 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 in the heart of, every, of, of uh, everybody. But don't you see there are so many parallels exactly with the new way or I'm sorry, this is my uh, uh, personal Italian neorealism. I mean, all, all, yes. these, all these waves, they, they, they all lasted five, ten years, great mm. maximum, which doesn't mean that Truffaut wasn't making movies until, until his dad, and Godard is still, doing, mm. he's still doing video stuff. But, and, and as just been said, the experience, history of Tamilian Jose and that the new generation and they themselves, specifically in, in, in the interview and very interesting Q&A that we had last day, they, they talk about the urgency and maybe there is not that urgency anymore or that pressure or that uh, uh, moment in time that was particularly favorable for these new director. I'm, I'm, I'm talking, of course, about uh, Jose Asien and Tamilian, etc which have been stable and, and, and marker, but then even if they do continue to make movies, that, that parenthesis in history is finished, is over. And also to, to other question, I, I was reading the, the question about Yang Yat Chi in the, um, in the dialogue, right? I mean, all of us here, or and me myself first, struggle to find a unitary, style or uh, style or aesthetics for this new director. So maybe one of the, 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 the idea that is so difficult to label this mm. new of course, it's also because they themselves switching from different jobs has been said, right? So advertisement <laughs> or popular, uh, switching from um, Khan Film Festival, because Yang Yatsu, was it in Khan or Berlin, maybe his Shui uh, Guan was in somewhere. Um, and they not fail, but do we recognize a particular Qian Wei or avant garde or revolutionary style? While that was much easier for the Hosea Sen, Yang Yang, uh, Tai Miliang, Yang De Chang, etc. And one last thing that I think is very interesting, like like a, a, a full circle somehow. Um, David Lohmann has been mentioned, and actually I know I, I produce in, in French and Italian this useless language of small countries, but I, I was traveling, but working on some David Lohmann stuff, but then it's so interesting because we go back to the university because only university could really take David Lohmann seriously, even if it was a huge box office success. And Zhuge Liang is, of course, a, a, an icon in Taiwan. And I see this also for Italian comedy popular in the 60s, right? Like after the neorealism ended somehow, they appeal, but they only appeal to a very specific local audience with local jokes, um, innuendo to politics and the like. But otherwise, we have to maybe get it back to the academy field, like now we are watching Thai UPN in university with the full support of uh, theory, history, 
dialogue among specialists because otherwise non-mediated I try with my entourage I try to just show a David Lohman stuff and no it would not I mean if it if my interest specifically in Taiwan uh, that's a big no okay okay um I saw Chris and uh, Song Hui both raise your hands uh who go first Chris this time oh. Okay, yeah, just to follow up on what uh, Corrado was just saying, I think it's very interesting to talk about the role of universities and mm -hmm. here we are in them after all, um, you know, and how these kind of events are and these kind of spaces provide a kind of foothold for doing things. So earlier Bin Chen was talking about how and of course, it's true, you get a big award at a big festival, you can get the films recognized. But then what if you can't get the films into the festivals? If you're not getting that recognition, are there other ways to start to get people talking about it? And of course, with the Thai UPN, the Taiwanese language cinema example, some of you know that I spent many years trying to persuade a festival that will remain nameless um, that is supposed to be interested in popular Asian cinema and doing retrospectives of popular Asian cinema, you know, to show a few of these films. And of course, they always say they're interested, but they never did it. Um, so in the end, you know, we'd start going into universities and we've done two, what would you say, iterations of the Taiwanese language mm. cinema project. The first one, everything is universities. When it comes to the second one, oh, you know, Five Flavors Festival would like to show the films. Mm. Other festivals would like to start showing the films. So this is obviously another strategy, even if it's not a prestigious, you know, strategy, mm. right? Or a high profile strategy, but there's a kind of bottom up strategy as well <laughs> that you can pursue. Yes. Thank you. And um, some way maybe. Yes, very briefly, uh, I have a Okay, a, a serious and a less serious take on the topic of David Lohman, right? Um, the less serious take is that, you know, we have not talked about the relationship between film taste and class, right? Uh, which is obvious. Uh, and the more serious take is that, of course, um, to teach these films, you need to have accessibility and availability of them, you know, yes. subtitles and whatever. And that, of course, is where I think, you know, a lot of popular cinema may not be traveling as well because of that reason, right? But I would really love to hear Chris answer the second <laughs> question by Timmy Chen, if, if that is what um, the moderator would like to as well. Are you asking uh, uh, Chris? Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no. So I finished. I finished. I say oh. uh, addressing. Okay. Questions. I'm just wondering uh, whether there's time for Chris Barry to answer a question in the chat room posed yes. by Chen, but posed to Chris. I would love to hear Chris' answer. Why me? Yes. Exactly. You. But, but I have to <laughs> say because now in Hong Kong and in Taiwan it's midnight. I know. So you know uh, this is. I would like Chris to answer very briefly, if you may, if you can. Would that sure. be okay, Chris? Yeah. Okay. So the question is, how can Taiwan cinema reckon with the role of PRC censorship? For example, um, the popular TV series, yeah. um, and also the boycott of the Golden Horse Awards. Um, you know, I think one answer to that is every time the PRC does something like that. It's a fantastic advertisement for Taiwan, um, you know, and uh, I think, and I actually think the Golden Horse Awards should make the most of that, you know? Yeah. I mean, if we're gonna be forced back into a new Cold War, why not start using the discourse of freedom again, right? Where is it free from censorship? Where is it free to watch what you wanna watch? Certainly not in the PRC, right? Yeah. So I think there is, that's the answer to that. Um, even though it may not be, uh, you know, uh, what people, none of us want to go down that kind of road, 
but uh, you have to make use of it. When you are a small, a small country, you have to use whatever little uh, leverage you have. And that is the lesson going right back to the Taiwan new cinema, right? You look for the leverage you have when you're isolated. Fantastic. Um, uh, Robert, you are coming in. Yeah, I'd like to add quickly that uh, actually that's what's happening in Taiwan right now because of lockdown and because of COVID-19, Taiwan, I believe, is the only place in the world that we are we can watch movie freely. And nowadays, right now, it's a Golden Horse Film Festival going on. And I believe that's very, very good and a big advantage for Taiwan cinema. Thank you. Well, on that note, so what an amazing uh, uh, afternoon we have here. Thank you so much, you guys, amazing. And uh, uh, I can't believe, you know, two hours fly by by this, just like this. It can go on for another two hours, I'm sure, but it's, it's very late, uh, uh, especially for, uh, for two of our panelists. So I have to draw to a close. I'm very sorry because, you know, if you want to stay on and have a chat, you're welcome to, but thank you very much, especially for our six amazing panelists for such a wonderful and insightful uh, discussion. And may I ask the, our audience now, switch on, please switch on your audio and video, put your hands together and thank our wonderful panelists. <laughs> I'm not sure they can switch it on. I need to switch them on. Uh, or you can just um, put a thank you or something in, in the chat. Ah, yes. I'm very sorry I didn't switch you guys on. So, but don't forget, tomorrow we have another uh, lecture uh, by uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Brown. Another is, uh, of course, direct Q&A with uh, Director Zheng Youjie. So uh, thank you, guys. It's amazing. Um, Really a, amazing session. Thank you very much.